Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Breakfast Club, where spring has sprung thanks to our returning guest and perennial fan favorite, Dr. Natalie Nagalingam, our curator of botany. Hi, Natalie. Hello, Laurel. Um, I realized today, or remembered, that you were our very, very first Breakfast Club <laughs> guest, which was 18 episodes ago. That's a lot. Wow. I know. I'm happy to be the first returning guest. Yeah, well, you're not the first returning guest, but oh, no. um, you're the most special to my to me in my heart, though. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, of all of our returning guests. Um, also, I think it's a real occasion to like mark how far we've come. Like, look how much suave you and I already are on screen. We're so like relaxed and we polished. Are, yes, yeah. we're not awkward at all. Yeah. <laughs> I was trying to. I was thinking about that as like a measure of the passage of quarantine time. Like the things that like help me realize time is passing, and it's. Slightly less, well, not really less awkward, but like slightly less like awkward on the inside on on these broadcasts. The darkness of the circles under my eyes, the number of Prosecco bottles piling up in the corner, the number of sweatshirts I have without stains from eating chocolate covered pretzels, which is officially zero as of last <laughs> night. <laughs> and yes, and just how polished you and I now are in our leg return to the screen together. So I'm so happy that you're here. And what are, you gonna, yeah, yeah. what are you gonna tell us about today? So I am gonna tell, tell us, tell all of you about flowers. Flowers, and we have a very special invention today, which is flower cam, which you will yeah. all see throughout the broadcast to let Natalie get close up with um, those freshly picked co-hosts of hers. Yeah. Um, and Natalie, do you love flowers? I. I don't want to reveal this, but <laughs> I'm not actually a fan of flowers. I was talking to some entomologists who kind of compared it to um, everyone loves butterflies. The entomologists are kind of like, oh, butterflies, whatever. Yeah. So um, as a botanist who works on ferns and cycads and conifers, I'm kind of like, oh, flowers, whatever. But I do appreciate the um, just the sort of form and the beauty of flowers. And so I kind of wanted to share that with everyone today. Yeah, but they weren't your gateway <laughs> drug into botany, it sounds like. like that no, was, was that no. Well, mm -hmm. no, actually, so I do remember when I was an undergrad learning about all of these things that I'm going to talk about today. And I was mm -hmm. kind of like, wow, this is amazing. There is this whole world just everywhere that we don't even notice. And so that's what I want to share today. OK, well, I'm really excited. I got a tiny preview of this. Um, and I'll remind people that you can ask Natalie questions at any time just by leaving them either in the comment section of Facebook or the chat box on YouTube. We'll come back at the end and ask as many as we can. Um, and so I'll, I'll get out of the way and let Natalie and Flower Cam take over for a closer look at flowers. See you at the end. Thanks, Laurel. All right, hi, everybody. Um, as you can tell from my accent, I'm from Australia. And so what I wanted to do was show you some flowers of Australia. So I had this family's cute image of um, a, a jar of Vegemite and some Aussie flowers, some Aussie wildflowers. Um, and I wanted to start off and talk about the national emblem of Australia. There's two animal emblems, which is the kangaroo and the emu, but the floral emblem uh, is the golden wattle. And you can see it here, uh, these, little, um, these little buds here, these yellow buds uh, represent the wattle. And that's how we get the gold and the green of Australia that the, all the Australian sports teams wear like to the Olympics and to the soccer and hockey and everything. Uh, and so it was only really recently in like 1988 that the golden wattle was declared the national flower of Australia. But before that, it was long considered the emblem of Australia. Uh, here in the US, uh, the national emblem is the, the national floral emblem is the rose. Uh, and that was declared in 1986. And here you can see Ronald Reagan signing um, the declaration that says the rose is a floral emblem. Um, and here is the Congresswoman uh, who was from Louisiana and she sponsored the bill to declare the rose as the national flower. Um, and here she is with a bunch of flowers. And really that was quite a feat because over time there were like 50 other flowers that had been proposed as the national flower. Um, but she made it go through Congress and through the Senate to end up um, on the president's desk. And so the rose is the national flower of the US, but it's also the national flower in the UK and in the Maldives as well. Way before that, in the Victorian times in the 1800s, the Victorians used flowers as a way to talk to each other. Uh, and 
around this time, the Victorians were getting flowers from all over the world. So there were thousands more species of flowers and plants being brought into the United Kingdom and sort of brought everywhere throughout the world. And so what they did was they started to tell each other stories through flowers. And so, for example, if you know um, what you could do is kind of send a message to people. Either you could wear those flowers. Um, so, for example, if you were strolling around, you could wear a poppy, which means I'm not free. So, if anybody had designs on you, they would know that you weren't available. Or you could send someone a message through flowers. So, for example, um, you could send somebody some an apple blossom. And that would mean I prefer you above all. There were so many flowers and so uh, many, um, it was sort of hard to figure out what each meant. And so there was actually dictionaries published to help people understand the different meanings of flowers. And so there were many, the meanings um, of flowers published in the UK and in um, the US and also in France as well. And so here's one from France, and this talks about um, the pansy over here uh, and what the meaning for the pansy and so many other flowers either derived from their mythological roots um, or from the characteristics of the flowers. And so pansies, they apparently, and I don't see this, but when they dried and sort of became older, they looked like somebody who was really thinking and very pensive. Um, and so the French word um, penser means to think or be very pensive and re um, reflect on things. And so here the pansy was meant to be a signal, a sign of uh, thinking or remembrance or being pensive. And so that's how flowers got their meaning. Uh, way before that, the flowers had a different kind of meaning. Uh, in the Middle Ages, well before um, science and medicine had really taken root, people used what they call the doctrine of signatures. And this was these are images I've taken from a book called the doctrine of signatures. And they had this idea that it was kind of God or mother nature sending us, sending us messages in flowers to tell us how to use flowers uh, in a sort of medicinal way. And so here, um, this daisy is supposed to look like an eye. Uh, and so they thought, okay, we can cure eye ailments through using these kinds of flowers. Um, there were plants that looked like kidneys and so they used it to treat kidney problems. Um, I really don't know what a plant that you looks or a flower that looks like a unicorn is supposed to treat. Um, maybe, maybe they thought it gave you magical properties. I, I don't really know. Um, but really since, you know, this is an idea that people had, um, unfortunately people kind of still believe that mother nature is sending us signals. Um, but as I'll show you later, um, Plants don't look like the way they look to give us messages. They look the way they look to give their pollinator messages. And so we'll see more of that later. So flowers are the reproductive organs of the, a special group of plants that we call the angiosperms. Um, and so I'm gonna go through later on and tell you what are the actual parts of the flower and how they're used for reproduction. But flowers weren't always around. They first evolved about 135 million years ago. So that's when the dinosaurs were stomping around. Um, T-Rex would have been around when the first flowers started blooming. And the first flowers, in fact, when I first learned about this in undergrad, we were taught that the first flowers were really enormous and showy. Um, and in fact, discoveries since then have showed us that the first flower was actually really, really tiny. And so these are actually charcoal flowers. The petals have, have fallen off. But what happened was in the Cretaceous, so uh, over 130 million years ago, flowers, um, the fire was really common in the landscape. And so these early fossil flowers became charcoalified. And so what we can do as scientists is we get acid and we remove them from the rock and we can study them. Uh, and so these are the pollen grains from these flowers. Um, this is a top view of the flower. And when you reconstruct it, this is what the flower looks like. And it's actually really similar and related to modern day water lilies. And so what we see in the fossil record first though, are the pollen grains, so these tiny little pollen grains. Um, and then we see flowers and then and we also see leaves at the same time. Mostly we see leaves and pollen because flowers are really, really delicate, as you know. So it's really hard to preserve a fossil 
flower in the fossil record. After flowers arose, then at the same time, we see an explosion of all the pollinators and the insects that eat flowers. And so we see some kind of co-evolution when we start to look at the fossil record of insects as well. So flowers didn't evolve in isolation, they evolved together with their pollinators. Um, and here's a, a couple of insects here. Today, food is, food is almost all derived from angiosperms. And this is an example of a plate of things that we eat. And so grains, for example, they derive from the grass group. Um, and so, you know, ri rices and wheat, they derive from flowering plants, which um, are grasses. Beans and legumes, um, meat, they, so beans and legumes are also a flowering plant group. Meat, uh, we have animals that eat things like corn and oats. So they derive from flowering plants as well. Uh, carrots, strawberries, uh, broccoli, um, all of these things you hear are all derived from flowering plants. They could be either the flower structure, which is what broccoli is, um, the fruit, uh, which is the um, strawberries and the blue and the blueberries. That's right. Yeah. Um, or they could be like the, the root in the carrot um, or the leaves is in spinach. So all these different parts of the flowering plant is what feeds us. And so flowers and flowering plants are so critical to our survival. And as I was, I sort of shelter in place, uh, I walk, go for a walk every day. And I've been seeing the spring flowers all around my neighbourhood. And so what I wanted to do was to tell you about the flowers um, so that as you're sheltering place in your garden and in your neighbourhood, that you can actually look around and take a closer look at all of the flowers that you see um, and get sort of more of a botanical view and understand what you're looking at. So firstly, what is a flower? So it consists of both male parts and female parts. And the flowers that I'm going to show you um, in this section, these purple flowers, these are flowers that are just growing around San Francisco. Um, and I've taken all of these photos with my iPhone and it's nothing special. So this is something that you can see um, and this is something that you can capture as well. So there's no special equipment that I've used. And the unique thing about flowering plants is that they have the male parts and the female parts in one structure. There's only one other group in all of our evolutionary history that did this and they become they became extinct and so the group this group the flowering plants are the only one alive to actually keep these two structures together the male and the female parts so the male parts consist of the anther and the filament so the anther is this furry bit at the top and the filament is like the stick that holds it um, together we call it the stamen and it's the anther that releases the pollen Typically, they surround the central part that has the female part, which consists of the stigma. And a way to remember this is the sticky stigma. Uh, and that's where the pollen lands. And then you have the style that, that um, is at the base of it. And then at the, and at, the very over, at the very base is the ovary. And together, we collectively call that the pistil. Botanists have so many terms, and we love to have different terms for all these different things. When you have a, a side view of it, you can actually see it much um, more clearly. You can see the sticky stigma at the top uh, and that's where the pollen lands. And actually this one's kind of brownish because pollen has landed on it. Uh, and then you have the style that is at the base of the stigma um, and that leads to the ovary. And that's where the ovules and the eggs are. If you flip the flower upside down, what you can see is the sepal, so these green parts um, and of course the petal. And the petals are all different colours uh, depending on what flower it is. And so just to sort of sum it up, these are all the parts of a flower. You've got the sepal. And what the sepal does is protect the flower in, as it's a bud. Then you've got the petal. Um, you've got the female parts. And here you can kind of tiny, you see these tiny little uh, ovules here. And that's where the eggs are. Um, and then you've got the male parts. So what you have here is what we call... Um, a perfect flower and that means it's got the male parts and the female parts so the female parts the stigma is here and the stamens are on the outside but we can also have what we call an imperfect flower and that means the male parts are actually on a separate 
um, flower to the female parts. And this is not that common. Uh, and so this is in the squash family, for example, you have separate male and female parts. And so here we have the stigma, the sticky stigma in three branches on this flower. Um, and then you have the anthers over here on another fat flower. You can also have another variation where you have three petals and this magnolia, the petals are really enormous and they're all separate. And then you contrast that to something like these, the Brigmansia, angels, angels trumpets. Um, the, the petals are all fused to form a tube. And again, that's going to be related to the pollinator. We can also have solitary flowers, so flowers that occur by themselves, or we can have flowers that occur all together, and we call this an inflorescence. Um, and I, this is, I think, one of my favourite parts about botany, um, is looking at inflorescences. The flowers can be arranged in many different ways, um, and that's sort of indicative of different species and different groups of flowering plants. And so I wanted to show you, I'm gonna trial flower, flower cam, um, and show you what it looks like on um, the as flowers. And so this here is the flower that I showed you before. Um, I actually picked this today. So you can see that there in the very center is the stigma. Let me see if I can get a pencil over here. There's the stigma here. Um, surrounding it are the anthers and you've got the petals at the base. And then if I flip it upside down, you can see the sepals down there. Um, and I also picked a, a bud and you can see how the bud here is protected by the sepals. And so that's the primary role of the sepals here. Uh, and then I wanted to show you, so that was one that had three petals. You can also have fused petals. So that one has a few petals that are fused all the way. So they get fused all the way to the tip. Or you can have partially fused petals and they get fused only part way. So you can see they're fused part way and then they're free over here at the very end. And then the final thing that I wanted to show you is an inflorescence. Um, and this is a salvia. And the way that you can tell an inflorescence is that you have all of the flowers on the same structure. And then at the base of it, you get a leaf. And so this is what we call an inflorescence. Okay, so I hope you liked flower can. Um, so what I want to tell you now about is pollination. So just to go back to all of the various structures that we looked at, looked at, we have the male structures, we have the female structures, and the petal and the sepal. And what happens is that the goal is for the pollen to land on a stigma. And when that happens, then the pollen tube grows all the way down the stigma and then it will grow around um, through here, around the ovary up here, and then it will, the, the sperm will fertilise the eggs over here. And then that's how you get a fruit, basically the, through the pollination process. There, there's a whole bunch of mechanisms that prevent plant flowers from pollinating themselves. Because if you think of it, you don't really want to have inbreeding um, because in a lot of cases you get genes that double up and so you get um, deleterious mutations. And so plant, plants have figured out a whole bunch of ways to prevent um, what we call self-pollination, so basically inbreeding. So one way that they stop uh, breeding with each other, so even sort of pollinating the same flower, is through differences in timing. And so you can see these two flowers here. In this case, what you can see is that the anthers are all ready to shed their pollen, um, but the stigmas are not what we call receptive yet. In the flower next to it, the pollen has already been shed from the anthers. And so you can see they're all like little tiny, um, they're kind of withered. And then here, the stigma, um, all of these stigmas are, are separated um, and they're ready to be exposed to pollination. And so that's a physical separation of pollination. Plants also have another mechanism, which is through chemicals. And so there are genes that actually uh, produce molecules that help the flower to figure out whether this is from the same plant or from another plant. And so it, it sort of has this sort of recognition process that says, okay, you're from a different flower, 
therefore I am going to allow this pollen tube to grow. Um, if you're from the same flower or the same plant, that pollen tube will not grow based on those chemicals. Um, and then physically, you can get the anthers and the stigma in different sides of the flower, different positions, and so they're not going to brush up against each other um, and pollinate each other. And so when we look at flowers, we notice flowers because they're so conspicuous. But flowers didn't evolve because of us. I mean, flowers are 100 or over 100 million years old, um, and we evolved really, really recently. Uh, and so really all of these, this evolution happened um, in the absence of us. And the way that, the reason that pollinators can find flowers is that because they're so bright uh, and they're so conspicuous. And so that's why flowers are the way they are. Um, and so if you think back to that doctrine of signatures, flowers are not the way they are because of us. They are the way they are because of pollinators. And this is one really amazing example of showing how flowers are adapted to their pollinators. And in um, when Charles Darwin went around the world, he went to Madagascar and found this particular, or actually he went, he was sent this particular orchid species um, that was found in Madagascar, sorry. Uh, and so when he saw this, he saw this huge nectar spur. So all the way down here is this, what we call a nectar spur. Um, and at the very base of this spur is the nectar. And when he saw this, he thought, well, there must be a pollinator that has this really large mouth appendage um, that can reach the base of the nectar spur. And this pollinator hadn't, hadn't been found yet. Um, it took decades later, well after Charles Darwin's death, that scientists actually found the pollinator. Um, and here is the, the, the proboscis. And so you can see this is as long as this nectar spur. And so basically, based on evolution and co-evolution, um, Darwin figured out that there had to be a pollinator that suited this flower. Um, and in fact, here is a specimen that scientists from the Cal Academy found when they went to Malaysia. And so this is actually in our collections in our building. Um, and, and it's not very common to find. It's a very rare species. Uh, it's called Darwin's hawk moth, by the way. And so flowers like this one and all the other flowers that we see are adapted to their pollinators. And I put this double asterisk there to remember to remind you that there are flowers that we have bred today that kind of look a little bit different to how they were in the wild. And so things like roses, for example, there are so many more petals on them um, because we've bred them to look like that. Things like dahlias, we've had so many um, sort of breeders and um, cultivators who have made different um, cultivars. So they kind of look different to the wild ones as well. But generally, when you look at a flower in the wild, it's going to be adapted to its pollinator. And so, for example, bees, I'm going to go through all the different pollinators. Not all of them, of course, because there's so many. But bees, for example, are the ones that we know probably the best. And flowers that are adapted to bee pollination um, are generally tubular. And this is an amazing foxglove. And you can see the bee fits in it perfectly. Um, it, can, it crawls in and it gets the nectar. Uh, and so often flowers that are adapted to having bees as pollinators uh, have these tubular flowers. They have nectar as a reward. They have lots of pollen as a reward for them as well. Um, and some flowers also have like a landing pad for the bees. So flowers like these um, have a landing pad. And again, here's another example of a, la a landing pad. And the thing with these flowers is that when you put them under UV light, that can show you the, the guides to the, um, that the bees will see. And you can also, before I go on, you can also see the, the colours of the flowers here. So the ones below are the UV light uh, images and the ones above are what we see. And the colours that the bees can see are blues and yellows, and so you can see the yellows and the purples, but bees cannot see red. And so in general, if you see a red flower, that will not be bee pollinated. But the bees can see UV light, unlike us. And so the UV patterns on flowers, um, if you look at a flower under UV light, indicate to the bee where to go to find the nectar. Uh, and so it's really, if you look online for UV flowers, um, it is spectacular. 
Um, this is just one of them that I found. And so it really, it just glows to sh show the bee, come here, this is where your food and pollen um, is. Bees are so critical to flower pollination. We would not have almonds if it weren't for bees. Um, almonds do not have any kind of um, pollination other than bee pollination. And so what farmers will do is they will hire bees and bees will be brought into their orchards and then they, they pollinate the uh, almond flowers. Bees are also important to other crops that we eat. So things like strawberries, um, coffee, green beans, um, squashes, like so many, I put so many, so many things uh, are reliant on bees. And so things like the, the die off of bees that we've been seeing lately is really critical, not just because of biodiversity, because of the food that we eat. Another really famous pollinator that I'm sure you all know about are butterflies. They are attracted to the flowers by the, by the scent of the flowers. Um, and another key for flowers that are pollinated by butterflies is that the nectar will be buried deep inside. Um, and so its mouth parts are, allow it to go all the way down um, into the base of the flower. And if you think of it, a flower wants to be pollinated specifically by a butterfly because the way that the different um, male and female parts are, are arranged allow the pollen to be transferred onto that butterfly. So we don't want other insects crawling on there um, and taking that nectar. And so that's why the nectar is specifically hidden um, and can be reached only by the butterfly. Butterflies, um, flowers that re rely on butterflies also have a, a landing pad. And so you can see this really nicely here with this daisy. Uh, and flowers that are pollinated by butterflies has specific colours such as red, yellow, orange and purple because those are the colours that butterflies see best. There's also flies that pollinate plants and it's not really common um, but they are really fascinating. So they, these flowers that are pollinated by flies are kind of purplish and burgundy uh, and the reason is because flies are attracted to rotting flesh and so this sort of purple colour reminds them or sort of indicates to them that there's something like rotting flesh um, and these flowers also have uh, a scent that kind of smells like rotting garbage or rotting flesh and so that also attracts the flies to those flowers. One of the coolest flowers that you'll uh, we, that any, any botanist would love to see and so this lady um, kind of conveys the excitement that all botanists have in seeing this flower and this I have not seen this flower even though I've been to Malaysia um, and Southeast Asia. This is called a Rafflesia and this is a parasitic plant and it is enormous. So it doesn't have any leaves because it parasitizes other plants, but it, it has these huge flowers. Um, and again, it has that purple kind of color, that sort of dark blood red color. Um, and it has that rotting sort of flesh smell. And so that means it's, it's pollinated by flies. And so the flies come in into, into the center here. Another plant that is pollinated by flies is the Titan Arab. And I took this photo at the Conservatory of Flowers. And that, what you saw on the previous slide, which is the Rafflesia, which is the largest flower. This is the largest inflorescence. And so I'm gonna talk about what this structure is in, in a little bit, but this is the largest inflorescence that you'll ever see. And so here, here's a guy with his kid on his shoulders and this inflorescence is still taller than them. Again, when I saw this plant, I walked into the conservatory and it just had such a strong smell. This is from like the entrance of the conservatory all the way deep into the conservatory. I could smell, um, it smelled like rotting garbage. You know, when you have like fruit and compost waste, it just smelled just like that and it permeated everywhere. So I could, you can tell that flies are smelling this scent and from all over and then they come and they get attracted and pollinate this flower or this inflorescence, sorry. Flowers that are pollinated by birds, they have different, different structures and arrangements. Uh, they are kind of, they allow for perches. And so this um, inflorescence stalk is really rigid and it allows this sunbird in South Africa to hang onto the stalk um, and um, then get the nectar 
from the flower. And another feature of these flowers that are pollinated by birds is that the flowers are kind of hanging down. And you can see perfectly how this hangs and so that bird can put its beak in and get that nectar that's buried all the way deep in the flower. The other feature of flowers that are pollinated by birds is that they're mostly red or similar to red in colour. Um, and this is because birds see red really well. If you compare that to bees, bees don't see red at all. And so this allows these flowers to be especially uh, pollinated by birds. And hummingbirds are one of the sort of more famous bird pollinators. And if you look at this flower, my point, laser pointer is hidden because it's red, um, but this flower here is perfectly shaped to the hummingbird's beak and it's going to be like in the centre like that. Um, and as the hummingbird goes into the flower to get the nectar, the anthers, which are at the very um, uh, edge of the flower, they brush the top of the hummingbird's head. And so pollen lands on the head of the bird um, and then when it goes to the next flower, as it is flying up, it will brush the stigma and the stigma will get pollinated. The other feature about flowers that are pollinated by birds is that they're open during the daytime. And this makes sense because birds are active during the daytime. But if you contrast that, you have uh, flowers that are pollinated by bats and they're open at night. So there are a few really rare flowers that are opening at night and so that's a, a signal that they're pollinated by bats at night. If they um, are pollinated by bats they also have like this fruity or musky smell which is what bats are attracted to. They're white uh, and so that allows them to be seen at night um, and they also have lots of nectar as a reward for bats. And so the, what the flowers do for all kinds of pollinators is, is provide some kind of lure to the pollinators um, and they also provide some kind of reward to the pollinators as well. Um, and they're kind of tricking them into getting pollinated. One other way that a plant can get uh, to undergo reproduction um, is through wind pollination. Um, and we don't think of this very often. We usually think of the birds and the bees as pollinators, but wind is a really important mechanism of pollination. Uh, and this is a field of corn. Um, and we often don't think of how corn gets pollinated, but corn has female flowers, and this is the silk over here of the female flowers. And then the male flowers are the tassels at the top of the plant. And so when you have wind pollination, there's usually um, no rewards because you don't need to give a, a, a pollinator a reward. Um, and you don't need petals because you don't need to attract any pollinators. And to look more closely at these flowers, uh, I, so what I, I found some pictures showing the individual parts of these um, flowers. And so remember the tassels are at the top and these represent the male flowers. Um, and so if you have a much closer look, you can see the individual anthers here and they re release copious amounts of pollen. Because if you think of it, the wind is carrying the pollen. So you're gonna have to have a lot of pollen for some chance of a, some pollen landing on the stigma. The stigma over here um, is the silk of your corn. And so here we have the hairy stigmas sort of just out exposed to the wind. So you have the pollen, um, the anthers exposed to the wind, the pollen gets blown um, and the stigma is also exposed to the wind. You can see it's not enclosed by petals or anything. Um, and then the pollen lands on the stigmas and then they fertilise the, um, the corn and this is what it looks like. So your corn is actually a stigmas, so the silk, um, and the pollen fertilises it to produce each individual corn kernel. So this is essentially a corn, a whole corn inflorescence. So flowers, I want to just also talk to you about different groups of plants. And so I'm just going to give you like a little mini rundown of the plants that you might see um, and help you identify um, and sort of become a botanist as you sort of walk around your neighbourhoods um, and look in your gardens and look in your parks. So the first group of plants that I want to talk to you about are the monocot group. And they're pretty common. You get them in bunches of flowers. You grow them in your garden. You have things like lilies. Um, tulips and irises that we'll all be seeing right now that it's spring. 
the key indicator of a flower that comes from this group of plants from the monocot is that the parts are in three so the stamens are in three um, the stigma parts will be in three and more obviously the petals are going to be in three the other key uh, feature of these flowers in the monocot group is that they don't have petals or sepals so remember the sepals are kind of the the um, green part at the base of the petals in this case there are no separate um, petals or sepals in fact what we call them are tepals so another word that botanists use because there's no no petals and no sepals so we call, we call them tepals daffodils are another uh, a group of plants in the monocot group um, and you can see they have six tepals so we have one two three so that is what we call the outer whorl of tepals and then we have one two three tepals again so we have six tepals in total and then they have this inner structure um, which kind of looks like tepals but in fact um, when we look at the genetics of this structure it's actually similar to the stamens um, and so these are actually derived from the male part of the flower um, that has been fused together to form this structure, which we call a corona. Um, and it's called a corona because it looks like a crown, which is a word that we've all learned about really recently. And so I wanted to show you some um, flowering plants. And so these are the monocots. Um, this one I actually pulled apart already. So here's one petal from it. Uh, and so then I'll pull out two more petals so that's the first lot of three then we have another lot of three one two three so that's another part of three and then in the center you also have three as well so you've got one two three so you can see that's easily a monocot because it's got all of the parts in three so it's got nine parts in total but each individual um, group of parts is a three um, and again, this is another example of a monocot. All of the parts look the same, but you have three petals here and then three petals here. Oh, sorry, tepals here. Uh, and so again, this is a monocot because it's got a total of six, which is a, a multiple of three. Okay. So a special group of uh, monocots are the orchids. Uh, and the orchids are one of the most species rich families um, in all of plants. Um, many of you know orchids and you have them growing in your place. And so I kind of wanted to tell you a little bit about the flower structure of orchids because they kind of do crazy things. Um, they're highly specialized to their pollinators. And so they kind of, they have scents um, that, and pollen that the pollinators uh, use, but they kind of also behaviorally trick the pollinators sometimes and look like in um, other insects, and sometimes they try and mate with them. Um, but the, so the flowers of orchids are really modified compared to what you're used to seeing um, and what we just saw before. So again, these have tepals. So they, there's an outer whorl, which is W H O R L of petal of tepals. So you have one, two, three outer tepals, and then we have one, two three inner tepals um, and that inner tepal the, there's one of them that has been modified into a lip um, and that is kind of like a guide to tell the insect where to fly into that flower on the inside um, so if you peel away all of those tepals what you have is a really modified sort of reproductive structures in this case we have the collar and what happens here is uh, evolutionarily the male and the female parts have become fused together into this one structure called the column. So the column is here and at the top of the column we have the stigma and that's the female part and then we have the anthers um, and then the pollenia which is what gets placed onto the insect pollinator. Uh, and so this is a really highly modified flower structure. Um, but I hope for those of you who have um, orchids at home, you can have a look at your flowers um, and, and see all of these different structures in them. The other group of plants I want to show you are the flowers of the daisy family. Um, this is what blew my mind when I first learned about botany in my undergrad classes is the daisy family. Um, daisies have many, many species. We love to grow them ornamentally. 
they um, are just absolutely beautiful. We grow them as, um, as uh, to give them as flowers as, as well. And we also eat them. So things like sunflower, so we have sunflower oil, sunflower seeds. Lettuce is also in the daisy family. Thistles, so artichokes are in the daisy family as well. Uh, and so these are really important um, for our, our food and every, our everyday lives. The thing with daisies is that they look like individual flowers, but in fact, each individual flower consists of multiple flowers. And in this case, what we have here in that looks like a petal is actually an individual flower. So we have a whole bunch of flowers on the outside, um, and this is one type of flower. And then we have another type of flower um, on the inside. And so I'm going to show you what that looks like. So what we call them um, is florets. Each individual flower in a daisy is called a floret. And you can see here is a little tube. And at the center of the tube is the stigma. And so each individual sort of circle, circle bit in the center of the flower um, flower actually actually represents one flower instead of um, a part of a flower. And so what we think of as a whole flower for say the yarrow for example um, actually consists of the two types of flowers. So the center has what we call the ray florets and this I love this illustration because it shows it to you so clearly. You have the petals um, and then here you have um, the anthers and so these center ones over here are all made up of these ray florets. The ones on the outside represent the disc florets. And here you have the stigma. Um, you can see the two arms of the stigma and one petal. And so it's a highly asymmetrical flower um, on the outside, whereas the one on the inside, the ray florets are more symmetrical. And if you look at other flowers or inflorescences now that, now that you know, uh, they are composed either entirely of ray and disc, so that you have the ray, the ones that are tubular in the center, and then you have the disc florets um, with the asymmetrical petal on the outside. So again, this is the, these are what it looks like when you separate them. So you've got the ray ones and then the disc ones. You can have other ones like chrysanthemums, and they're composed entirely of ray florets. So those are the ones with the asymmetrical petals, so all like that. Or you can have flowers, um, and this is a billy button from Australia. Um, you can have flor sorry, inflorescences that are composed entirely of disc florets. Sorry, the ones in the center. So the tiny sort of round ones. Um, and so I wanted to show you the, a couple of da a daisy that I picked this morning. Um, and so it looks like this, here we go. And so, you know, if you have a look at it, you'll, you'll think, oh, well, this is just a, a flower. But in fact, each individual petal consists of one flower. And so I pulled apart one, a flower, an inflorescence before. And so here is one flower. And the structures are over here. So it, this is kind of hard to see um, on a phone. But as you see, as you go ha have a look at the daisies in your neighborhood, please have a look. and tear them apart and see all the different structures. Uh, and then this is going to be really hard to see, but there is a tiny little floret at the center here. So that represents the sort of dark purple ones on the, on the inside. So that one there. So there's so many of them um, that it's kind of hard to see. Okay, so the last group of plants or flowers that I wanted to tell you about and, and that you'll probably run into are flowers with what we call bracts. And bracts are, they look kind of like petals, but they're actually colored leaves. And when you take a closer look at, at these uh, flowers, they're actually inflorescences with these bracts or, or sort of colored leaves. And so a couple of examples that you might know are dogwoods. So the petals are actually these bracts on the outside and the flowers are on the inside. Uh, and the same with um, poinsettias at Christmas time that you, when you see them, those are really bright, um, bright red bracts and the flowers are on the inside. 
those um, another example of that are the is bougainvillea and that's they're really common right now especially around san francisco um, and what you have are these sort of purplish bracts on the outside uh, and the flowers on the inside so in this case we've got one flower here another white flower here and then another flower here another group of plants that also have bracts are in the arum or of a philodendron family. Um, and in this case, the bracts um, uh, enclose the inflorescence, so this spike, and we have a special name, as I said, botanists that love all these different terms, and the, the word for that is a spade. So it's just uh, unique to the arum and phil philodendron family that we call this structure here, the bract, a spade. On the inside, the, there is the inflorescence, so that stick-like structure, um, and we call that a spadix. It's also in peace lilies, so if you have this growing in your home, um, again, you've got the spades on the outside, and then if you look more closely at the spadix, there are individual flowers, so each one of these is a flower. Um, so you've got the, the stigma at the top, and then you've got some anthers sticking out at the base there. So this is an inflorescence again. Uh, and so I have a couple of examples of these uh, for flower cam. So I picked this bougainvillea this morning, uh, and you can see that the, these have the in the flowers on the inside. If you can see that, there is the white flower on the inside, um, and there's a couple of flowers that are developing it and haven't been um, haven't opened. Um, and so even when you sort of feel it, it actually kind of feels a bit different. It's sort of and it looks more leaf like, and so. These are the, the bracts on the outside. Um, and I also picked some leaves and you can see how similar they look to leaves as well. So those are the bracts and the leaves. Um, the other example that I have is um, the calla lily. So I picked this from my back garden. So again, um, you have the bract on the outside and then the inflorescence on the inside. And then I actually chopped one apart and it's like producing pollen everywhere. Uh, so you have, the male flowers and that's producing a whole bunch of pollen um, and then at the base here you have the female flowers so you actually have two kinds of two kinds of flowers um, on this one inflorescence okay. um, so some other flowers uh, another example of this is the titan arum the titan arum um, that i showed you before and again so now that we've learned all about inflorescences um, and the spade and the spadix. So what we have on the outside um, is the bract, and then we have the inflorescence on the inside. Um, and so this is the world's largest inflorescence. Uh, it is, um, they, they're grown all, all around. Again, it's from Southeast Asia, like the Rafflesia. Um, and then just to finish off, since we saw the largest flower, um, which is the Rafflesia, we saw the largest inflorescence. I wanted to show you the smallest flower and the smallest flowering plant, um, which is wolfia, which is in the um, duckweed family. Um, and each individual little blob is a whole plant. And um, so you can see that these are absolutely tiny. They just, they grow on the top of water. Um, they're often used um, in ponds and sort of aquariums as well. Uh, and so if you look at some of these, this is a close up of one of these little dots. and this is a flower in the center. So this is absolutely tiny. Um, what's amazing is that this flower is in the same family as the Titan Arum that you just saw, um, but this is the tiniest flower that we have. And I was trying to figure out how these plants are pollinated. And I put out the question to Botany Twitter yesterday. I got uh, many, many, many likes, but nobody was able to let me know how these flowers are pollinated. So. Um, it could be through water pollination. Um, it could be some tiny insect or invertebrate. Um, I actually think we don't know the answer. So that kind of tells you that there's a lot of questions in botany that we still need to answer. Um, so that is that for all of the flowers that I wanted to show you. Um, these are some flowers that I just found through walking around in my, in my neighborhood, going through the, the park. So there's so many flowers around you. I hope that you get a chance to explore them all. 
um, and have a closer look at them and use all the information that I've shared with you to actually help you understand and um, know what you're looking at and appreciate the beauty in flowers. So thank you. Thank you, Natalie. That was, I think, my favorite lecture so far for like terminology, the tepals and coronas and um, <laughs> pollinia and spates. Um, and I also love that you gave us this kind of secret decoder, or not secret, but this decoder for what pollinates what, like between landing pads and stiff stalk yeah, colors. Yes. Yeah, I feel like people, lots of people are going to go out walking tomorrow and have kind of a whole new take on what they can see. Thank you. Yeah, I hope so. Oh, yeah. I just remembered, I forgot to show you some things on Flower Cam. Oh, Flower Cam, please. Okay. <laughs> so I am... Um, Botanists are kind of nuts, as I've kind of <laughs> indicated. So, you know, when we go on vacation, these are the kind of souvenirs we buy. So I bought this um, magnet of a Rafflesia um, in Malaysia. So this is it. This is what, you know, I was so excited. I mean, you can't find this kind of magnet anywhere. Um, so this is the world's largest flower that I have as a magnet. Um, I also went to the Chicago Botanic Gardens and I bought a magnet of the Titan Arum. Um, so they had one blooming. I missed the bloom, but in fact, I was able to get a picture of the magnet, which was very exciting. Um, and then this one is uh, one of my favorite. Oh, is another favorite of mine. Um, it is an enamel pin of uh, an amorphous phallus. Um, and it is, I, I have the fly pollinator. And this was a gift by your yours truly, our, our truly, our truly, no, our host, um, <laughs> Laurel, how do I know, I don't know how to say that. Um, so Laurel gave me this really cool gift. So it, it's an amorphous phallus with the pollinator. Um, and I love that Laurel knew so much about plants that she knew to buy the fly separately. So this was actually sold separately, but she, since she is an honorary botanist, she knew to get both together. Thanks. Um, that thank you, honorary botanist. I just knew that you. I just knew that like you. We would always want you and I really enjoy the like kind of like underbelly of like whether it's like a flower or whether it's good gossip or something else. Like, of course, you need the fly. I wasn't going to not get you the fly. <laughs> um, and we had some questions about corpse flowers. We also had just all kinds of general questions. So I'll kind of get started. Um, so Colin had a question basically about how flower colors developed as flowers themselves evolved. Um, and yeah, he's basically just sort of asking how that happened or what that process was like. So we, we don't have, if you think of all the other plants and they don't attract insects through their pollinator, through colors. Um, so we, we don't really know in terms of early evolution, what the colors of flowers look like. Um, so we're able to look at genetics and figure out how we get different colors today. Um, but that's something we, we, we sort of can't figure out with the, with the fossil record. So we kind of, we, we, you, can kind of, you can kind of figure out how to do it through genetics, but not through fossils. Okay. Um, and Jay Gomez asked, with the imperfect flowers that you were talking about and showed, will male and female flowers be on the same plant or does each plant organism have its own gender? So this is one of the things with botany is that there's kind of like the general statement where, you know, you have male and female flowers and then right. you have imperfect flowers. Um, and then you can have male only plants with male flowers and you can have female only plants with female flowers. Um, and then we have plants with both female flowers and male flowers, um, but on separate parts of the, it's, and we have terms for all of those as well. Yeah. Um, so we have the, the ones that are, have male and female plants are called monoecious. Um, and then you can have dioecious. And it's just, we, we have so many terms that I can't even remember them all. Yeah. yeah. You can have you can have everything. Yeah. It's mind blowing. The yeah. variety of mind blowing. Yeah. Evolved all these different ways. Yeah. Um, and he asked that very early in the broadcast. So I imagine like the, you, you kind of covered a lot of it as he went through, but I think like, did I did anyone else wake up today and expect to have their minds blown by like a daisy or I mean like an orchid predictably was going to blow your mind because they're crazy looking but some of these other flowers that look simple and turn out to just be just this whole other kind of category of amazing yeah this yeah. talk was, I'm so glad that you I'm I'm so glad you did this like I know we originally were like cycads cycads but I'm glad you like preempted it with flowers um 
So Jared had a question about the reflesia, and he said, when you when you were talking about it parasizing parasitizing other plants, what does that actually mean? Oh yeah, so it when a plant is a parasitic on another plant, it doesn't have its own leaves, and so it taps into the roots of other plants, and oh, wow. it basically steals the all the you know the sugars and the nutrients that that other plant has produced through photosynthesis, and so it doesn't do it on its own. It just take it just steals it from the, the other plant that it, it's parasitizing. So oh. another example of that is. Um, mistletoe so you always see mistletoe growing on another plant mm -hmm. um, and that's because it's parasitizing that plant and so it just sucks out all of the stuff that the other plant has done it's parasite oh wild um and then so this was a youtube person who asked uh, and also about the reflesia why why it evolved to be so large and they say wouldn't that make it more difficult for it to sustain itself so th those flowers are really sort of short-lived um mm -hmm. and so I think part of it is producing enough scent to attract the flies. Um, but yeah, it's kind of, I'm not sure, I, I don't know why they have to be so big. That's probably a good question. Yeah. Um, this one is probably from an, a, someone who watched your previous um, breakfast club in which you asked people to name a fern and they'd like to know if you have oh. named your flowers. <laughs> oh. I don't have flowers. <laughs> I don't <laughs> like flowers. <laughs> I, don't really I do have a garden, like I have veggies, but I have yeah. not named any of my veggie plants. But I do have tomatoes and lettuce growing. Mm -hmm. um, so I have, you know, a daisy family in the lettuce. Um, mm -hmm. So I have, I have different plants. <laughs> you're just, you're, you're like, no, 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 really. Like, I'm, I'm good. I'm good with all of these. Yeah. <laughs> um, let's see here. So. Oh, we had some nice comments from people saying they can't wait for the academy to reopen. That's very sweet. Thanks, Sia, or thanks, Linda. Um, Elise asked, what are the oldest flowers that we have in the botany collections? We have some flowers that were collected um, during the Captain Cook's voyage, um, and that was, gosh, 1700s. Um, and so they... Captain Cook and Joseph Banks went all sailed all around the world uh, and they collected plants. So Banks and Solander, Joseph Banks and Solander from the Swedish. And they have collections that, you know, from Australia, um, from, um, from South America. And in the botany collection, we have some of some of those specimens um, that were collected. So they're over 200 years old. And the thing with our collections is that because they're on archival paper, uh, and they're stored at really cool temperatures. We keep the insects away from them. Um, we keep light away from them. We keep humidity away. So that means they get preserved for hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's that's probably the oldest ones that we have. That's amazing. And does their age mean they would have been among the specimens that were saved by Alice Eastwood from the fire? Or did they come to us from a different session? So that they came to us from the British Museum. Oh, um, okay. So they had kind of like, when we, you go collecting, you kind of collect doubles mm -hmm. just to send to other places, you know, just in case like, you know, the Cal Academy burns down. So there's extra kind of copies of those collections elsewhere. Mm -hmm. And so the, that, those copies from um, Solander and Joseph Banks were, were donated to the Academy. But we definitely have some, we have about 2,000 plants that Alice Eastwood saved uh, and, but those are kind of more recent, um, recent, so 1,800 yeah. plants instead of 1,700. Newbies, yeah. And for anyone who doesn't know what we're talking about, the Alice Eastwood was um, a, a very, very early botan, botany, was she a curator? She yeah, she curator, was. Yeah. Yes. Like one of the first female curators, I think. And yeah. that um, the fire from which she like single-handedly rescued hundreds of specimens at great personal risk was, what year was that again? That was 1911. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. After, during the Great Earth, after the earthquake. Mm -hmm. um, and what I love about her is that she went back, she went into the building, you know, that it had crumbled down and the stairs had crumbled and the, only the railings was left. So she climbed up the railing um, to like the sixth floor of the academy to save the specimens. So, yeah. And she didn't save her own stuff. She just saved the specimens. Yeah. Yeah, it's incredible. I have to talk our um, librarian, Rebecca Kim, into coming on to tell us more of these stories. Yeah. Um, okay, you have a handful more, so I should keep okay. going. Let's see. Um, let me actually grab Katie, who asked, oh, is there an easy way to tell what flowers are edible for humans? No. Um, <laughs> I, and you, I mean, you really need to be careful as well, because mm -hmm. things that 
look very similar to each other can actually be poisonous. And in the herbarium, when we t we bring people through, we have examples of these two different two flowers, um, totally different species that look really similar, um, but then they're actually one is poisonous and one is edible. So you can't tell, um, and you have to be really careful about it. Okay. The so don't just know. go eat things randomly. Yeah. I hope you're listening, Katie. Um, Elise, oh no, sorry, we have asked hers already. So Sandra asked, and this is a question about the corpse flower. Does the corpse flower need to attract a certain number of flies to successfully pollinate itself for that cycle? Um, I mean, the more flies that it attracts, the more um, pollination events that will occur. Because remember, it's, a, it's an inflorescence, so there's multiple individual flowers. So each of those flowers will need to get pollinated. Um, I mean, it's kind of like, you know, you have the, the more chances, the more sort of events that you have, the more um, sort of chances of pollination that's going to happen. So uh, that sort of the, the more scent that you produce, the more flies you produce. So it's sort of the bigger, the better, really. Okay, got it. Um, Bruce was curious about the um, carbon flowers that you showed at the beginning of the talk. And he wonders if you know, if we know, what animals would have pollinated those. Um, so those probably um, some, some kind of insect, uh, you know, it's really, it's hard to tell again, like in the fossil record, you know, it's hard to capture behavior. Mm -hmm. So we don't really have many examples of, you know, insects with pollen grains on them, but they, sometimes in amber we do. Um, you can see there's an insect with a particular pollen grain. I was reading an example of that a little while ago. Yeah. Uh, so um, that is also always fascinating, but you can kind of infer based on what the, the flower looks like what kind of animal would have pollinated it? Yeah, okay. Um, we have another going or ancient history question. And I'll just ask you three more. And anyone okay. whose questions we don't get to, we'll try to loop back in comments and answer them later. Um, but so this YouTube user asks, um, for flowering trees versus flowering plants, do we know which came first and whether they have a separate evolutionary history? That's a good question. So flowering, um, what we think is that the early flowering plants are really sort of what we call herbaceous plants mm -hmm. uh, and they were able to kind of take over from the other plants because they grew really quickly almost like they're, like they're all weedy plants okay and so they were able sort of to proliferate and produce many more species because they were just so weedy uh, and then the next stage was them becoming trees and kind of taking over taking over the forest and replacing things like conifers okay cool um, and we can see that in the fossil record too okay neat um, let's see here. Susan asked, um, is there a most endangered flower in the world? That I don't know. Yeah. Um, because, well, the most endangered group of plants are the cycads, which I work on. Mm -hmm. Um, but generally orchids are highly endangered. So I think if we look at right. the, um, flowering plants, the orchids as a group are highly endangered, but there are many species of flowering plants in general that are on the endangered list mm -hmm. um and that's one of my pet peeves is that you know it was um Ind endangered species day on friday uh, and there's all these new pictures of animals and you know let's save all these animals but there's yeah. so many more plants that are endangered um and we often forget them um, and they're critical to all of life on earth yeah i feel yeah, there was a i think there was a study that came out recently that was looking at the effectiveness of um like memes and cute gifts on helping people care about endangered and it was animals of course it was like still the charismatic megafauna stuff but maybe that's just what we need maybe we just need to find a series of endangered plants and make them into like gifts in the wind and add googly eyes and i think it could help a lot like i think we yeah. just need to imbue them with personality because yeah humans have a hard time you know <laughs> like we have to help them we need some we need some meme writers yeah <laughs> call us um okay so maybe a final question I'll take Aaron, this question from Aaron, which is, are there any big flower mysteries facing botanists today? I mean, just in terms, in terms of evolution, we, you know, sort of trying to piece together yeah. what different species are related to each other. Um, we're still trying to figure out so many like genetic mechanisms, the genome, how genomes have evolved. Um, you know, the one that I showed of the wolfia, like I posted that question on Twitter. I looked right. all over like online. You know, how is this plant pollinated? And, um, you know, I got like like 80 likes, but nobody answered the yeah. question. So, right. you know, yeah. I think that there's a lot, like there's so many things that we don't know about, especially things like pollination 
um, you know, it, it's hard to figure out what pollinates what because you have to sit outside. And a friend of mine did this for her PhD. You have to sit outside in the heat and just watch, you know, insects going to the flowers and seeing what they do. Um, yeah. That is not easy. Yeah. Yeah. And it's a big deal to stump science Twitter. Like that's a good. That's a good <laughs> yeah, that's right. yeah. um, well, Natalie, will you come back in the not too distant future and give us the promised SciCAD talk? Because yes, we had a lot of that. Okay. Yeah. Great. I don't know how we do what is I don't know what our um like version of flower cam will be for for cycads but we'll have to figure out like your talks always have a little extra so we'll have to like work on yeah that. Okay. okay we'll sort it out okay deal all right great well for everybody who is here today thank you so much uh come back on Thursday we'll have our director of Morrison Planetarium Ryan Wyatt back for a, our monthly um kind of universe update so it's actually he'll use planetarium software to steal you through the steal you through the universe to look at things that are um like current events happening, such as the fact that they just discovered a black hole that's not far from Earth, like relatively speaking. So taking back Thursday for that. And um, yeah, Natalie, we really, we really like when you want to, when you, when you're SciCAD ready, we're SciCAD ready. So like, just let me know. All right. We'll see you soon. Okay. Thank you so much. Bye everybody. Bye.